Hey there. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining us for uh, the latest in our series of conversations uh, with writers. And my name is Andrew Verlaine. And today I'm delighted to be joined by David Butler. Hey, David. Andrew. So if I could just do a quick uh, introduction. So David Butler mm -hmm. is an award-winning novelist, uh, poet, short story writer and playwright. His third novel, uh, City of Dis, as published by New Island and was shortlisted for the Kerry Group uh, Irish Novel of the Year uh, 2015. Thanks. You just pull it back a bit so we can see the title. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Uh, literary prizes, uh, David is wanting, uh, include Benedict Kiley, the Maria Edgeworth, ITT Red Line, and Fish International Awards. Uh, David tutors regularly at the Irish Writers' Centre in Dublin and is married to author Tanya Farrelly. He's also the author of uh, this collection, uh, Stories uh, Fugitive. Uh, and I think uh, Danielle McLaughlin puts it quite well uh, that uh, this collection of stories is unsettling and often wickedly funny stories written with verb and assurance. Uh, David Butler is a master of the striking image and the fresh turn of phrase, deftly drawn portraits on lives on the points of breaking. So yeah, it's a collection I really uh, enjoyed. So thanks for for joining us today, uh, David. Um, yeah, delighted to. Great. So uh, would you like to tell us a bit about your latest uh, published book? Uh, well, the latest published book, it's one of those things you wait years for a bus to come along and then three come together. Uh, very unusually, three books came out together in 2021, a couple of years ago. A novel, a book of short stories and a book of poetry. So as you mentioned, there was Fugitive, which was um, the set of short stories that came out with Arlen House that had been accepted for publication in 2016 and there was a long, long wait for it to finally come out. But it, uh, it collects together, I suppose, um, stories that were written over about 10 years. My previous book, Short Stories of Greater Love, had come out in 2013. So it was about eight years worth of stories I was able to select from. So it became almost the greatest hits of that period. That's what Fugitive was. Um, Dear Press then brought out my uh, third poetry collection, Liffy Sequence, the same year. Um, and then very unusually, my fourth novel was accepted by an English publisher on condition that he could publish me under a different name. <laughs> it's a bit of a long story, but he refused to publish me as David Butler. So we had to come up with a pen name. And my late mother, um, her maiden name is Kavna, and I'm the second son. So we came up with Dara Kavna. So a novel called Prague, 1938, which is a historical novel, my only historical novel, also came out in 2021. But it was one of those really strange years because of COVID and lockdowns that we didn't have a launch for the novel. We didn't have a launch for the poetry except online. And we had a few scattered small launches for Fugitive, the collection of short stories. I seem to remember chatting to you at that, uh, Andrew. That's right. It was a good, uh, it was a good event. I recall um, there were a couple of writers at as well. I think Tanya Farrelly was at it as well. And there was, um, yeah, she, she was launching her collection of short stories the same night. And then... Uh, an author from up north, Rosemary Jenkinson. The three of us were coming out with Arden House pretty much at the same time. So we organized our own launches, one in Belfast, one in Dublin, one down in Kerry as well, and one in Ray. It's a good evening, yeah. The one in Dublin, that was that, yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, cool. And um, and you had a musician as well at that one in Dublin as oh, well. Oh, yeah, Keith Burke, yeah, a good friend of Tanya's. He actually played at our wedding a few years ago, but... Um, yeah, he's um, <laughs> he's always a, a great lad to just show up with an acoustic guitar and play his own songs. He's a, an original songwriter. Yeah, it was and, really it was a real multidisciplinary sort of launch. Like, it was, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Um, and so um, I, I usually I usually finish with with a question about kind of people's future plans, etc. But would you like to talk a bit more actually about that um, the the book that you'll be publishing is Dara Kavanagh. It's when you mentioned sure, it's your mother's yeah. maiden name, I think a few authors have done that before. I think Michelle Welbeck, that's actually his mother's maiden name. Uh, his real okay. name is Michelle. Okay. His real name is Michelle Thomas, but obviously he doesn't want he didn't want to be confused with the, the guy who does the um, the, the language sure. course is called Michelle Thomas. But um, yeah, sorry, Dara Kavanagh. 
even thinking about Bray, we have Hosier. Hosier is his mother's main name. You know, Hosier the singer. So that's where, where he gets that. Yeah, well, okay. Um, well, first off, you need to know a little bit about the publisher, I suppose, Daedalus. They've been knocking around for 40 years. There happens to be an Irish publisher called Daedalus as well, which is kind of confuses the picture a little bit. And they're, they're both about equally old. Um, they, were, they both began in the 80s. I think they knew of each other. But uh, Eric Lane, who founded and runs Daedalus, um, it's specifically there with an eye to European fiction. Um, so he published a, a lot of fiction in translation from loads of different languages, some of it classical, some of it contemporary. And then he publishes authors who have an eye to Europe. I suppose as well and um he had published he'd agreed to publish this novel of mine prague 1938 i sent it to him because it's entirely set in the city of prague in 1938 it was in the title and i felt it might fit in with him and he got back very quickly saying that he would be more than happy to publish it where it's a debut novel but because i had a back record of several other novels um he didn't necessarily think it'd be a good fit I and mean, how would we negotiate that and he wanted to invent a fictional australian author <laughs> who would who would put it in. and i was going well I, I don't see why so eventually we just compromised and um, that it would be a pen name but we don't pretend i'm a debut novelist anymore it does actually say on the blurb in prime 1938 that i've had other stuff published because it would be very embarrassing okay. if, if okay. we made a shortness for a a debut novelist prize and then it, it turns out you're not a debut novelist or whatever but anyway um there's been a project i've been working on on and off for at least 20 years which i've always assumed was entirely unpublishable it's um it responds to an instinct that i inherited from my dad to come up with really bad puns and dad jokes and things like that it usually comes um, from the father's side. <laughs> <laughs> and also um, a novel that has fascinated me since I first read it at the age of eight is Alice in Wonderland, and even more so through the looking glass. I keep going back to those as an adult, like, you know, there's something just about the weird logic and the language games and the imagination that has just always fascinated me. And then throw into the mix, say, Flan O'Brien, at Swim Two Birds or, um, you know, on Bail Bucht or any of those. And what I came up with 20 years ago, just as a fictional framework for what I wanted to do, was this idea of a crowd of slightly disgruntled Republicans in the 1930s who go over to the UK and decide they're going to bring down the empire by passing off a counterfeit language. And can I just check these are Irish Republicans, are they? Yes, Irish Republicans, yeah. yeah. Listeners in the US are out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, Irish Republicans. Irish Republicans. So they decided okay. they're going to bring down the English language by spreading counterfeit words, basically. Um, and they're being pursued by a branch of police that's called semantics, just like you have forensics, you have semantics or whatever, and Inspector Quibble. And that was something i was playing around with for a long time and the first manifestation uh i submitted to lilliput way back in about 2003 and um andrew farrell found it fascinating or actually i should say he found it fascinating as, as a thesis he said there's a bit of england water running into this but it's not it, it's only half baked which it was and I've been, I've been just fiddling with that on and off, never thinking that there would be a publisher who would touch it with a barge bowl, and that was okay. And um, it's just that when Eric Lane of Daedalus approached me after Prague 1938 and said that this year is their 40th anniversary, would I have a second novel that would be suitable to him? Now, like many writers, I've more than one unpublished novel on my hard drive. So I gave him a choice of three, and he said, I really like the sound of this one, uh, which amazed me. So I sent him the manuscript of what's now called Jabberwock. It used to be called Semantics. It's now called Jabberwock. And this had swollen to uh, about 140,000 words. It was a big, bulky text, complete with over 300 footnotes. 
and the footnotes are all sort of like you know messing with history or um playing with uh puns ideas it's kind of the territory of say terry pratchett or douglas adams or someone like that you create your own universe and your own rules within that universe tristram shandy maybe like you know yeah I so did uh, one of my one of my unpublished books. Actually, I did I did have footnotes and things, etc. That were partially true and partially fictionalized. But uh, I think his Infinite Jest was probably the biggest influence in, for me in doing. Oh, that sure, book. yeah, yeah, well, Mr. Wallace. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I kind of <laughs> I don't know how to put this, but I, I, I'd hope there's no kind of um, clever postmodern intellectualness in mine. I think it's just more fun. Let's just go for the fun. Now, I think it has a lot to say, which I'll come to later on, maybe. But um, anyway, I sent that over to Eric. He took a while reading and he got back to me and said, listen, um, I think there's a lot of potential in this book. I hated the footnotes, going to get rid of them. Um, it's about twice as long as it should be. You have, a, you have a story that needs to be dug out. And then we've been in negotiation ever since. So the first time I sent him a second draft, this is the major heavy lifting, I rearranged a plot, I ditched 50 pages, half the footnotes went, I sent that to him. He wanted some more changes, I got another 25 pages, a few more things changed around, straightened the plot, sent that back to him. And he was on the point of asking for more, and I kind of said at that stage, this is about last month, I said that what I thought that the cuts up to now had improved it, he was looking for too much Alice, and he wanted me to get rid of too much Wonderland. And I was saying the point of Alice in Wonderland is nobody cares. There is no journey. She's just somebody who experiences all these weird things. You know what I mean? She experiences Cheshire Cass and Humpty Dumpty and, you know, um, the White Knight or the Red King or, or Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And each one of those is just mad. But nobody really cares that she's following a chess game, moves in through the looking glass. And you don't even know what she's doing in Alice in Wonderland besides going to sleep and waking up. And I was saying that you're looking for too much of an Alice story, whereas the fascination for this is the different uh, strands that are brought in. I just call that the Wonderland area. So eventually he's agreed, and um, we're moving into the just the proofing stage now, as well as a, a lot of puns proliferating. There's a lot of just um, fonts. It, it, it's Shandy-esque in the way it plays with text and plays with expectations and it deliberately tries to interrupt itself the whole time. Um, if you like, I, I, I could read the first couple of pages just to give you the flavour of how it sounds, if, if that wouldn't be... Yeah, I think that'd be that'd be pretty exciting. I, and you were saying this might be a bit of a flagship uh, novel, I think. I, I think it might have been before we start recording. Well, I mean, the, the best thing about um, Eric Lane is he got 100% behind it when I sent him the second um, revised draft, he put out on the Daedalus uh, Twitter feed, um, this looks like it could be one of the great Irish novels of the 21st century. And he's not a man that does that for, you know, he, for, for most of the books he publishes. So he seems to have really embraced it to a certain extent. And he's decided that um, he, he, he's totally anti-Brexit. So he began signing up Irish authors about three years ago. There's a guy, Owen Smith, who was brought out two books with him. He'll have a third book coming out next, next year. Um, there's myself. There's um, just sadly somebody who's no longer with us. But he's decided to take that kernel and to make a Daedalus imprint in Ireland for Irish authors. And he wants Jabberwock to be the flagship novel. So he's booked in. We're launching it in Hodges Fidges on Thursday, 5th of October. And he's also simultaneously going to launch Daedalus Ireland on that night as their label. The same way I suppose Penguin have Penguin Ireland kind of thing, like, you know, um, which is really exciting, I think, like, you know, so hopefully it'll become a, a, an established label here as well. Um, but just to give an idea of how the book sounds, I, I said, think maybe if, um, if Flann O'Brien had written Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> no. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Grace, uh, good comps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here we go. To begin with, Hackett may not have been Hackett. He may have been Rooney, but that's another story. Our story begins in the year of the abdication crisis. It is a pivotal year in the history of the European continent, and one, moreover, that finds our hero at low ebb. 
shuttling out of a dive off Lower Dorset Street in order to give the landlord, Neil of Nugent, the slip. A native of Cavan, Manus Nugent was scant of height, scanter of breath, and scantest of all of respect for his tenants. Oh, a nice collection of scapegraces and ne'er do wells. That one of them had once enjoyed a reputation as a newspaper columnist was a matter of the utmost indifference to his calculus. Mr. Ignatius Hackett was £13.10 and six behind in his rent, so he was, and pounds, shillings, and pence were the holy trinity of the Nugent Creed. Hackett shunned out the door, gazed myo myopically up and down the street, then gravitated down a side alley in the general direction of the River Liffey. From a shambling gate, which, like his politics, was left leaning, it was apparent that he had no particular destination in mind, or if he had, no particular hour at which he was appointed to arrive there. He was as short of prospects as he was long in the tooth. That was the long and the short of it. The one concession to directing his perambulation was to periodically correct the innate tendency to drift to the left, occasioned by having, since birth, a slightly shorter left leg or a slightly longer right one, depending on how you looked at it. The effect of this effort was to impart onto the rhythm of his motion a secondary motion comparable to the epicycles with which Charles Boyle, fourth Earl of Orrery, had modified the circular motion of the planets. That morning, Hackett had nothing on his mind. It is a phrase that needs to be clarified. Now, as is well documented during an idle patch in the Thirty Years' War, a bombardier named René Descartes had tried to demonstrate the correlation between being and thinking by plotting modes of being, etfa, on the horizontal axis, and of thinking, pensée, on the vertical axis. As for instance, je pense que je suis fatigué versus je suis vraiment fatigué, and then joining the dots. By extrapolating backwards, he came to the startling conclusion that it was impossible to think of nothing. Although the corresponding graph has arguably had a more far-reaching effect on coordinate geometry than on either philosophy or psychology, in the field of effective psychotherapy, the maxim, je le pense, dont je le suis, is to this day referred to as the Cartesian proposition. Be that as it may, what Ignatius Hackett was engaged upon was not thinking of nothing, but rather thinking about nothing. In particular, he was considering whether the nothing that poetry makes happen is the same nothing as the nothing that philosophy makes happen, for each had its own claims. He was distracted momentarily by the old story of the bishop in the brothel, who, when asked whether he'd like his lady companion to appear in lace lingerie, replied, nothing would please thee better. Now, was that an example of a poetic nothing or a philosophical, or both, or neither? Were there other kinds of nothing? Were there, in fact, as many categories of nothing as there were categories of thing? Hackett was getting nowhere. But if he was, at least he was getting nowhere fast. By the time he reached the Ne Plus Ultra of Parnell's monument, nothing could have been farther from his mind. So I think that gives you some flavor of the continuous uh, way this knowledge just meanders as Hackett meanders. Now there is a plot and there is sinister comings and goings and there are spies and there are police and thieves and the whole bit to, to, to add plot to the whole thing. But um, I've spared you the footnotes. We've glanced over about four different footnotes that take you off in different directions <laughs> as we go along. And part of the point, Andrew, just to, to, to put it, um, what was going on in my head is I'm trying to make sense of the 21st century and how things like Trump or Brexit or whatever are possible. And some of it, I think, is tied up to the absolute excess of information that we have in the media, with uh, Wikipedia and you know all these, all these little rabbit holes you can go down. That's almost what the footnotes are. Some of them are real, some of them are falsified, some of them are in a different direction. It's impossible to have a straight narrative anymore, and you get all these competing sort of narratives, and you kind of choose which route to go down. And I'm trying to get that excess of information mirrored in some way, but I'm sending it back in the 30s so I don't have to worry about technology. 
<laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking of how kind of the historical setting as well. Is is Mr. Nugent the landlord any relation of uh, Mrs. Nuge from uh, Butcher Boy? By, by oh, no, that would have been nice. Yeah, had I thought about you, what he would have been. <laughs> 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 Maybe a second cousin at least. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. And so you're having a launch for that on October the fifth of, of this yeah, of 2023. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll just make it some Dublin. Okay, great. Good to get a plug for that. Fantastic. Yeah, so that, yeah. Just trying to go along to that sense sounds, sounds uh sounds brilliant. Um so yeah, I can kind of see, I suppose, yeah, that's audio headache, I suppose, for um audiobooks if you have uh, footnotes and things. <laughs> Things how to oh I, I can't imagine this one could be could be audio booked. I don't see how you would do it, like you know. I was um, listening to an audiobook of Trish Trisham Shandy over the last um last few months. Uh, but it was quite difficult <laughs> a difficult one to pull off, like there were certain points where like they were speeding up the, the, the voices like on a cassette tape and things like that. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean you could do equivalent games, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Like in, in Trisham Shandy, when you suddenly see what the squiggle of your man's cane looked like and you get this visual whoa, 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 whoa. I mean how do you do that in audio <laughs> but then many years ago I think you I think you know this I worked as the education officer in the James Joyce Center between 2021-2024 and one of the articles I wrote for our yearly magazine was on the translations of Ulysses I mean how do you translate Ulysses but then it's always amazed me even more how do you translate Alice in Wonderland I mean, there's a book that depends on puns in English. Yeah. Like, you know, um, we were taught by a turtle, but we call him Mr. Tortoise. Why? Because he tortoise. You're so dull. You know what I mean? How does that work in another language? And there's yeah, wonders yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. Alfreda Al- Yalanex, another author, is reading a bit in translation in English. And like, she does have a certain amount of wordplay. Maybe not to the same extent. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pun-based, etc. Cool. Um, I'm just going to ask as well just about... Um, in terms of work that hasn't been that, that you've done that you that you may not have published, I mean, is there any work that you tried to get published but were, weren't able to, or has there been any work that you decided not to publish uh, for whatever reason? Uh, well, certainly the first uh, category does plenty. So, I mean, Jabberwock for years, even when it was semantics, like um, no agent ever got back to me, even when I approached them. No publisher ever wanted to see the full manuscript until Eric did. And that was a 20 year project. Um, I was very lucky a few weeks ago in that uh, a short story of mine won the Chip Lit Festival in England in Chipping. And it was judged by a literary agent. And on the strength of that, he got in touch with me and said, OK, um, let's do a Zoom call. And the first thing he said was, Great story, though, it's brilliant, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that publishers in England will be interested in short story collections. So what do you have unpublished on your hard drive? And I have two novels that weren't published. What happened was, this, this is actually quite common, believe it or not. Um, New Ireland, uh, in 2011, they accepted this one here, the Judas case. And then... Uh, a couple of years later, this is the one that was, just, it's not a sequel to that, but it, it was with them again. They had both been accepted by Owen Purcell, the commissioning editor at New Ireland. And the third one in that series, um, it was called Under the Sign of the Goat. Um, he had just left and been replaced by a new commissioning editor when the third novel of that series was sent into them. And they hummed and hawed for about six months and decided not to go with it which is a big shock as an author. You kind of think, okay, I've done the hard work now. I've got a a publisher. My second book with them has been shortlisted for the novel of the year. Surely they'll take on the third one. You find very often, especially if there's a new commissioning editor, that they want to make a clean break. They don't want to take over other people's commitments. And that was certainly the case in New Ireland. And under the sign of the goat, has been looking for a publisher since then, to put it that way. And when that didn't get accepted, I wrote another novel called Tumbleweed, which is also um, six characters in search of an author kind of thing, also looking for a publisher or an agent. Um, it's almost as hard to find an agent as it is to find a publisher, as I'm sure yeah. a lot of your people will know. 
Well, one thing that we found myself, myself and my wife Tanya, we we run or we used to run Bray Literary Festival for five years, and we have thirty or forty different authors from all around Ireland coming and reading at that. And getting to talking to some of the big names, you realise that this is a really common story. Like John Boyne, um, when, after his first two novels, he was dropped by the publisher. Uh, Alan Mack at the moment, who was with Picador for the first two novels, once you're dropped after two novels, and it's usually because um, the second one hasn't quite sold as well as expectations, and you're now the band that already has two, two albums out there. So, you know, once you're dropped, it's very hard to get another publisher interested and it's impossible to get an agent. Agents want what's new. They want a new voice. They want you to have maybe a track record of you won two competitions and you have a story in the singing fly and you're the brand new, whatever it is. They don't want, well, 10 years ago, you had two novels and they didn't do all that well. The second one didn't do all that well. Well, we'll give you another go. And agents in particular don't like that. So you can get into a little rut because mm -hmm. you've had some success. And the case in point yeah. would be, Daedalus would only take me if I changed my name. They weren't going to There's, take me with David Butler, you know? When you said that, I was, I was going to say, uh, the, the debut novelist is quite uh, fetishized in the publishing mm. world. Um, for, Absolutely. It's like uh, Hollywood and young actors. Anyway, sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, okay, you don't want to be sued by Hollywood. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I, I don't think Hollywood in general can sue me, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, but no, I, I take a point. Yeah, like the um, and it's an interesting point. Yeah, that sometimes yeah agents might kind of exa um, exaggerate some of the tendencies of publishers. And um, yeah, my own experience was like I've, I've found um, um. I've received an offer of publication for for one of my novels, but it's um from an indie publisher, but I haven't uh, found a literary agent. So yeah, I think yeah, yeah sometimes yeah. you can have uh, more luck yeah with um yeah some of the, the presses, uh without necessarily finding an agent. Yeah, and um just with, in terms of are there is there been any work you've done that you decided not to publish that you thought maybe you could get published, but there was some reason you didn't want to, or has have you had that experience? I, when you asked that, I, I was mulling over my head, has this happened? And I, there's none I can think of, you know, there's none I can think of. And I'm trying to think of why I wouldn't want it to be published. Well, I, I, okay, there is this. Um, my first novel, The Last European, came out in Galway with a crowd winking the word, um, a small publish, independent publisher, uh, in 2004. No, 2005, actually. And I've kind of allowed it to sink into oblivion and don't mention it to people. And, you know, I've, I might have 10 copies at home. I never bring it along to sell. It's kind of the necessary first novel. It's like the kid that you keep up in the attic that you don't want to, you know, your friends or neighbours to see. So I do have one novel that's published that I, I, I kind of would prefer that people don't necessarily read, which is not quite the same thing, but um, it's interesting in its own way. I find myself now that, as I say, it was a necessary for us not because it's very overwritten, very kind of too arty or too trying to be arty or trying to be clever. And there was mm -hmm. an awful lot that I think I needed to get out of my system so that I could just write freer uh, books for a, where I'm not listening to the little voice of the critic in your head kind of thing. And the distance from that book allows me to see it as this was the necessary thing, um, domestic or whatever, that, that got rid of a lot of that stuff. So I'm happy to let that yeah. just, um, disappear. I think that's extremely common though, yeah, that a lot of writers will write one or two novels that they feel are kind of where they're kind of honing their craft and they never quite they never quite feel they're they're, they're happy enough with it. Sure, yeah, it, yeah. They feel yeah. It's something that's developed them, developed them enough that they get the, to the point of having an novel they would be happy to publish. Yeah, no, with um the book, the book I got the offer of publication with myself, Signal Play. It was, I, I kind of threw the tail on a couple of times just because I felt some of the content had the potential to really it could be quite off putting to people or uh, offensive at some level. And I kind of only went back to it, I suppose, after just speaking of pen names, where I kind of changed my my surname for the sake of um creating some distance, I suppose, between kind of the day job of kind of doing kind of research in a particular area and, and publishing in, in an academic field and then having the, the fiction as well. 
yeah, yeah, okay. Because that's quite a that's quite a specific sort of a yeah, case. Um, and so, do you have any other? Are there any other kind of future plans you have for your writing, or any other arms in the fire? Yeah, like, uh, I suppose, like as I said, the short story collection that came out in twenty twenty one had been accepted in twenty sixteen, and one result of that is that uh, I had about fifty stories to select twenty one from for that book. And then some of the ones that aren't in this one are all based around a fictionalized version of Carlo, where I lectured for five years. And what I'm trying to do now is build up, it's very common in publishing these days, the interlinked short story collection that is almost a novel. I mean, it's, it seems to be having its moment for the last seven or eight years. Things like, you know, Elizabeth Strout, Olive Kitteridge are. Um, Oh, there's so many of them. Uh, Liberty Terrace. Uh, what was the Summer Rain one? That Haunted on, on on by Chuck, Chuck Latner. Is, isn't it? It's a few years back now. That was an example. I well. mean, yeah. I, I often think that one reason that this is happening is that publishers want to be able to enter them into competitions as novels. There are so few for the short story collection. Whereas, say, Olive Kitteridge, for example, is really a set of short stories. She may or not may not appear in some of them, but that was eligible then for I don't know Pulitzer or you know Man Booker things like that. Um, one of the people I mentor, uh, Angela Flannery, her amusements came out last year and the shortlisted for the Art of the Year this year. It was really a group of short stories that the agent said, "Can we not interlink them a bit more and hone them and get it?" as a novel, and the proof of the pudding is it's shortlisted for the Irish Novel of the Year. So, you know, you do get that push from agents or marketing or the publishers themselves sometimes as well, you know. But I just, that's not in the back of my head for this, the third story collection. It's just that I want to actually explore the whole idea of interesting short stories and how they bring out a community. And I've been very lucky in that, um, like I, I told you, one of them has just won the Chip List Award this year. One of them won the Column to Bean Award last year. So they're already getting known, you know, um, out there, which is really nice. And there'll be a bunch, hopefully, of, um, oh, how would you put it? Um, when they're writing the blurb, it'll mention that, that some of the stories have done really well as standalone pieces, you know, which, which can be nice. <coughs> The spinning horse by Donald, the spinning horse by Donald Ryan was kind of an example of that as well. Sure, yeah, yeah, all these different voices, absolutely. The novel, actually, the novel that I'm publishing in a year or two, Stigma Play, is kind of there's a story within the story that's basically that kind of idea of interlinked uh, short stories, but then there's a broader frame story which happens sort of in the, the yeah yeah world yeah, of sure. the novel. But um, so it's it's kind of in a somewhat similar vein. Cool. Great. Well, um, thanks very much for, for joining us today, Dave. Is there anything else you'd like to... Absolute pleasure, Andrew. Yeah, with the, I'll stop the, the recording here. So thanks very much.